Hey everyone, welcome to the Entry Point Hunting Podcast. I am your host, Justina Lee Stoltz, the only podcasting host that admits that she doesn't know what she's talking about, but that's why I bring you the experts to give you that information. And today I am very excited to have Dylan Ayers on the podcast. Uh, for Dylan, he is the creator, founder, innovator of Eat Wild and Hunting has always been about two things for him, creating a community around food and connecting with nature. It's a philosophy he picked up from a long line of hunters, and it's one that he's proud to pass on to new generations. With a growing interest in learning to hunt from folks from non-traditional hunting communities, there is a gap in mentorship and support for this growing community. Dylan established Eat Wild in 2011 to support non-traditional hunters to find their way to becoming ethical, safe, and successful hunters. Dylan says the most challenging thing is getting out in the wilderness and getting the skills and confidence you need to figure out how the animals live and how to harvest them. Developing those skills can take years, but it's always worth it in the end. Dylan shares his knowledge and passion for hunting through his field workshops with Learn to Hunt online courses and YouTube videos and the Eat Wild podcast. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Dylan to the show today. How's it going? That's great. And, and I really love the professional intro. And you're, you're 11 episodes into this and like I'm already feeling like... Uh, I got to step up my game on the well podcast. So, so well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm an enthusiast. I tend to dive hard into things that I am passionate and interested in, um, which was exactly how I ended up getting into hunting too, is something I stumbled across and then decided, yep, I'm going to go all in for this. Uh, and I just happened to have some podcasting equipment around from another project that I had bounced into at one point. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Cool. Um, so start off us off a little bit telling us a bit more about your journey and your background. My understanding is that uh, you come from a hunting family, but that hunting wasn't always the most natural thing for you. And it took a little while for you to get into it. I, I, yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we grew up in a hunting family. So, you know, where it, you know, I remember there was always a, like in hunting season, there'd be some animal hanging in our in our basement or in our in, in the in the shed out back and we had big family butchering parties so as a kid like i gravitated to the meat the, the meat and food part about it ever since mm. i can remember being a kid like it was i was always you know running meat to the grinder for probably from the age of two or three years old yeah um but the killing part was it was a different difficult for mm. me like i always had a you know we we go hunting as a family and like I, i'd be kind of I, you know, I did, if I heard the gun go off it, up on the hill, I knew something had died, and that was yeah. that was you know that was perplexing for a young person. Yeah, but but you know, at some point, like you know, it all comes together, and at some point, at around twelve or twelve years old, I kind of got it, and I kind of like kind of got excited about when the gun went off. It meant that there was something, that, something exciting, or something really good had happened in terms of you know the for our yeah. family so what was the flipping point then like what changed from up to 12 and then at 12 what made it more exciting versus something that was a little bit more uh tre trepidatious you know there was probably like i remember chasing around quails in the okanagan mm -hmm. and it was sort of like you know for a long time i you know, I, I remember seeing a bird get shot when i was 10 and it was like super traumatic mm. um, but it wasn't one that it was, a, it was a neighborhood kid that had shot this robin with a t with a bb gun and then i think oh. it killed it it was terrible <laughs> yeah um so it was really hard for me to get excited about you know bird hunting but it was legal open season i think my brother and i were chasing around these quails with the 22 and <laughs> and uh it was kind of fun and we never got one but it was i kind of got into it i kind of was like oh it's yeah. so exciting right so that yeah. was maybe the first sort of like understanding that pursuit of an animal and when it sort of triggers that desire for that mm -hmm. for uh, not desire but like there's just something about it that happens inside you where you're like oh, okay this is exciting I'm, I'm i'm engaged i want this to work out mm -hmm. at that first feeling but the um i'd go to like my dad took me to whitetail camp with his with his crew of of, of friends for a few years and i think like about 11 was my first year and then um and I just kind of hung around camp and, you know, wasn't really interested in actually hunting. I was just sort of helped <laughs> out. But when I was 12 or 13, I remember like kind of just, there's, there's this thing that happens in whitetail camp when every day there's a group of maybe 10 to 12 hunters that all share a camp together. That's we a all big wall camp. Yeah. It's a, they're very, it's very organized. So they've got like yeah. two or three wall tents. Everybody's got a corner of a wall tent, the wood stoves nice. and a nice big kitchen area. Yeah. Um, 
and you know every morning the fires get made coffee served everybody in their bunks and then um and you go about your day from there and you go off hunting and then around yeah. noon um you know, most people sort of stroll back into camp around 11 o'clock because they've not had their hunt. But if someone's out a little bit later, um, like at noon or one o'clock, mm-hmm. like, you know, when that the vehicle dries up the driveway to the camp, everybody kind of perks it's up. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they're going to back up to the meat pool and like what's happening, right? Yeah. And and so I kind of got it like as a kid, I was like, I like whatever something the film would back out of the meat pole. Everybody gets excited. They all wander out from, you know, from camp and they wander over to the meat pole. They look at the back of the truck. Oh, that's a nice buck or whatever. And yeah. And then help. And then the camaraderie of helping get it hung. And the story that comes is, was something that I, you know, after seeing the reaction from other hunters, which were mentors of mine and people I really connected with, I kind of was like, I wanted to have that experience. I wanted yeah. to go and come back with the deer. And yeah. that was kind of the thing that really, you know, drove me to kind of get over my fear of killing an animal or, mm. um, or the drive to actually like, cause up till then I did a lot of wandering out of the woods and looking yeah. at deer with a gun <laughs> and I just was like, couldn't kind of get it together to shoot one, yeah. nor did I have it in me to shoot one. So it was kind yeah. of the next, that kind of feeling came over me. And the next day I, um, yeah, I, I was I, I had a successful hunt the next day, which was nice. That's amazing. Yeah, I um the last couple of years I've been fortunate to get invited to uh, one of my buddies, his family deer camp, him, his brother, and his dad, and and then often the the random friends that come along with it. And I I totally can relate to that feeling of camaraderie at the fire at the end of the day or the midday lunch break or whatever. And um, it's always the first question when you get back. So. What do you got? Did you get anything? Or if you're pulling in and somebody wanders out to see if there's anything in the back of the truck, kind of thing. So that's definitely one of my my fondest memories uh, of hunting so far because I have yet to actually harvest a large game animal, mostly just little birds. Um, but yeah, that that camaraderie at camp is is second to none. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing. Like I, I have a couple young hunting friends that are like sons and daughters of mm. of, of my of my crew now, and they're sort of in that. 12 to 15 year old range and it's like it's like the most exciting thing for them when yeah. everybody comes drives in like they're just yeah. like right on you they're like oh, yeah. <laughs> checking yeah. you out you got blood on your clothes you got in the back you know like, yeah it's, 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 so i wonder what that means i wonder what like how come it's so primal that we get excited to for when the hunter comes yeah. home yeah yeah it's that community that community feel of of when one person is successful, we're all successful because everyone knows. I mean, if you harvest a deer or, or a bear or whatever at whatever hunting camp you're at, it's not like you're coming in and you're just keeping it all to yourself. So a success, in my mind, a success to one person is a success for everyone at the camp. Um, so maybe maybe that plays into it a little bit. Everyone's looking for fresh meat. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it's, I mean, it's the communal aspect. I guess probably, and yeah, and everybody contributes, you know, in one way or another. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, very exciting. Um, and so once you were into your hunting journey, um, I don't know, I don't know how long that time period was between then and 2011 when Eat Wild started, um, but what sort of drove you towards eventually getting to to starting Eat Wild? Uh, well, growing up, I, so so my family, like my, my grandfather uh, is Métis from Manitoba and yeah. migrated to BC uh, to Musqueam territory, uh, post-war and raised his mm-hmm. family, which was my mom. And, uh, and they lived a fairly like, tr- like they, they, it was a, they grew up on the, what would, what you would call the West side of Vancouver, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. but they still maintained a lot of connection to that traditional way of life, um, hunting and fishing. Nice. Um, yeah. and, uh, my grandpa still trapped and built birch bark canoes and um was still very connected to his way of life that he brought with him cool. as a metis person but um but all that said like my mom you know went to school on the west side and met a boy from north van and they got married and that was my dad and and, uh, and then, then there was you <laughs> and that was me and i grew up at like marple it was just like you know pretty west side vancouver so yeah. um went to a high school called mcgee and a couple others too and yeah so there, there was just the hunting was not something that was part of the that community so yeah, very much harder was, to do in the city yeah it just wasn't there wasn't a whole pile of hunting families either right it wasn't yeah. like so so i i always felt a little bit like you know i was that that big pat the big part of our life that was hunting i thought it was a, that i thought it was a bit weird that you know we only ate moose meat and we only ate salmon mm-hmm. and yeah. uh you know i 
I tell the story sometimes about like, um, I thought we were kind of in, like we were, we lived in poverty a little bit because all we mm. ate was like salmon and halibut and moose <laughs> and venison <laughs> and like, all the, the glorious rich meats now. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and, and so, and I always felt like, I, like, and I didn't actually realize how rich we were as a family. Yeah. Um, you know, as I got older, my, my dad used to make, um, his, his form of harm reduction for, for myself as a teenager was to make really big meals on Friday nights, like bur moose burgers <laughs> or, or deer uh, or, or like deer spaghetti. But he would, mm. we would welcome the whole McGee rugby team on, nice. uh, wow. on, on Friday, on Friday after, after school. And we, and we had sort of semi, you know, we, he knew we were going to go out and drink a bunch of beer because we were 16 year old kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he felt like the best thing he could do was just make a bunch of pasta for us. And that, that way we have this yeah. solid base that like hopefully not end up <laughs> passed out in a ditch somewhere. Yeah, so, yeah. At least you're not drinking on an empty stomach. <laughs> yeah. But, but I didn't like, so what I did, like we fed so many kids in our house, wow. you know, like we've had cool. half the rugby team every Friday night and all the yeah. other kids that just maybe didn't, you know, uh, yeah. And, and it was all because we had this, this abundance of, of moose meat or deer meat or whatever. And, yeah. and we had a, you know, a passion for feeding people else, you know? So, yeah. um, so I didn't realize how rich we were. Anyways, that all said, it was, I never realized that, you know, nobody else hunted and it was a bit of a weird thing, but yeah. in the end, as we all kind of, you know, society changed so much in the last, like, well, I'll say just like at least people's relationship to meat in particular has changed a lot in the last 20 years. Oh, yeah. And, and I think people are really asking about where their meat comes from and how they can be more sustainable about their approach and and uh, be a little bit more connected to it. And I think if you're having those conversations, eventually you're going to ask yourself if hunting can be part of that equation mm. for you. And that's where Eat Wild started. So somewhere around 2011, uh, that conversation was happening a lot. And, and I, I was having that conversation a lot with my with people in my community for the first time. So, you know, as I, I kind of grew out of my high school scene and was in university and in the Vancouver art scene and music scene, there was a lot of people asking that question. And I'd go to parties mm. and I'd be at some art gallery and there I am in the corner and there's two or three people asking me about how they can <laughs> learn to hunt. And I'm like, well, this is kind of weird. Yeah, so, yeah. There's no, there's no hope in hell. You guys are going to be able to figure this out because you don't have, you know, a dad and a Jeff and a Larry and a, yeah. you know, a to help you do this. So how, yeah. how are you going to find your way? And yeah. and that's sort of where Eat Wild came from is that, hey, like there's a strong interest and it's a, I think it's good yeah. if more people in the city learn to hunt and more people from outside of sort of what you call a traditional hunting family are yeah. hunting because I think that grows the understanding of the way of life. And I think that's really the key of what, we're trying to do it eat well it's like yeah how do we get more people that aren't really the tr normal hunters hunting yeah. and talking about it yeah you know? so what was what was the catalyst i mean was it in the corner of an art gallery you're like hmm, i could uh, this could be a thing or like what, what was the catalyst to make you actually take that step because what were you doing at that time as a as a job or a career uh and and i assume that eat wild happened sort of as a side hustle to begin yeah. with it still is a side hustle and it's been okay, a side yeah. hustle. I'm very, very fortunate to have a career with provincial government as a park manager. I've been nice. doing that for 25 years and it's kind of the, it's not, not something I'm planning on leaving or changing up. I, I yeah. just got to find it. I find a way to do both and it's been kind of great to do, be able to do that. Um, but I did have like, you know, back in the, I don't know, 2007, I don't know what it would have been like leading up to, there, there was sort of a movement in in both the government space and and in the, and in the hunting space to like recruit more hunters. We'd seen a significant drop really? off in hunters, and uh, yeah, sort of post initial um, implementation of firearms laws and regulations, plus there's an, an aging out of that original sort of baby, baby well, mm. pre baby boomer hunter community, yeah. um, and there was a real drop off. So we went from like 110,000, 120,000 hunters, I think in BC down to like 70 or 80,000 oh, around wow. that time. So um, there was sort of this acknowledgement that, Hey, like it's kind of important that we have hunters out there for both the revenue that comes with hunters, as well as sort of justifying the existence of the fish and wildlife programs and such from a mm -hmm. government perspective. So there was, well, there was this... actually a push from government to encourage hunters to get licensed and such. Yeah, there was. It's well, <laughs> it's a very, very small little so when I was I was working on a program called the BC Conservation Corps at the time, um, which was like a how to you know bring um, uh, university students into government to help uh, mentor with park rangers, conservation officers, and and wildlife biologists, mm -hmm. and we would come up with projects. How could you put these young young folks to work in a project capacity? So like trail crews for parks, 
uh, exu- uh, people doing outreach and education for the CO service, um, people doing you know accessible data collection for biologists. Those are the types mm-hmm. of projects. And one of the more project- volunteer based stuff. Yeah, volunteer based stuff. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, no, there was these were paid jobs. These were paid oh, like, okay. just like summer jobs, basically. For yeah, youth crews, basically. And uh, one of the things we, were, we we talked about as a group was like, well, and, and something that was coming forward from the Fish and Wildlife Branch at the time was like, hey, like how do we get education out there around you know people learning how to hunt and how do we recruit folks? So one of the projects that a buddy of mine back at the time that was running the program, we were like, what about if we like market hunting to to like people at at uh at at um uh gosh i'm just you know at the farmers markets or mm. at like or you know or at whole foods or like places where people are really interested in where their food comes out like could could we have yeah. a pamphlet that says hey hunting can be for you like or, yeah. or like put people out there at a farmer's market in a booth saying hey would you yeah. be interested in learning more about how to hunt yeah. as, a, as a, way, a way of sourcing your food and and then try to figure out try to reduce some of those barriers and talk about it right so yeah. So we actually had a bunch of funding lined up and mm-hmm. we had to, BC Wildlife Federation was a partner in this project and and uh and it was kind of a go for at one point I was like this is amazing this is going to go we got like yeah, 60 grand we got a crew of youth going out there talking about hunting and we got a curriculum to put forward um but then yes as you know politics is the thing and we uh, an election got called at the mm. time and so like as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, I don't think we're going to go out and make food hunters <laughs> you know, wah, six wah, months. Wah. <laughs> yeah, totally. But there, I mean, I think inside a government, there's definitely an understanding of how important hunters are. Obviously, there's the, the, the politics around hunting is is, is complex. And mm-hmm. you know, I think you have to acknowledge that as well when you're in the inside. But there was yeah. interest. And at the time, there was a lot of interest. So um, and, and making that connection. So Eat Wild kind of was like, oh, I, yeah, we, we ended up naming the program. It was a, like a not externally named it, but we called it hunting for hippies. So <laughs> when it reached hippies about like folks yeah. that like we were kind of keen on this stuff, right? And, yeah, and, yeah. and like reach out to like the backcountry ski community, be like, hey, you guys are out here mm. already, you know, skiing and being in the wilderness. Yeah. Like just what about, you know, taking those put, skills? Put a gun on your back, yeah. <laughs> well, kind of, and then and there we are, like three years later, like there was this wave of people who were coming from the, the backcountry ski community or the backcountry hunting community or the organic food movement community. Mm. And they're all talking hunting. And and all of a sudden we're like, oh, well, it's happening. And, yeah. and that's when we kind of hung out the wild shingle to say, okay, well, here's a here's a place you can come land cool. and, and hang out with a community of like-minded folks that are coming at it from a f- perspective of food and adventure yeah. in connection with the outdoors and and, uh, and so and so what was eat wild's initial offerings and then it's evolved quite a bit over the last decade and a bit um to what you have now but initially what was what was the the vision well it there's the the initial thing that happened was we a friend of mine bought a ranch in on the Bonaparte plateau called singing lands ranch my good friend aaron kendall and when I was up there visiting, we were sitting in a canoe, paddling around a lake next to her property. And and I said, you know, it wouldn't be fun if I brought a bunch of people up here to learn how to hunt. And she's like, let's do it. And I'm like, great. She's oh, like, nice. she, yeah. she, so she's an old camp cook. She she she'd been a oh, camp oh. cook in uh, yeah. in in tree planting camp. She's like, I'll cook. You bring your people up here. We'll run around the property, talk about hunting, figure out a curriculum. Man, isn't that nice when you find like minded people and it all just aligns and you throw out an idea and they say yes. Like oh. I love, I love yes people. I try and surround oh. myself with yes people all the yeah. time. But when somebody has that same, like no, no boundaries, no barriers, we'll figure out the details. Yes, I like this idea. Let's just do it. Absolutely, I like yes people as well. That's yeah. great. Well, yeah, well, and we're gonna get to know each other because you're gonna come and hang out at what is now, I don't know, twelve years later, uh, the Hunter Field Skills Workshop, and you're gonna come yeah. and be part of it. So it's gonna be really yeah. Cool. So maybe talk a little bit about what Eat Wild offers now, because that was sort of the their origins of it. And and I'm assuming that that went forward. You guys did have a group of people come out to Aaron's property. Yeah, yeah, it was it was, it was, it was kind of a fun story attached to it because so I sort of built the curriculum. I bo- I wrote a little book and, and built the curriculum and and I put it out on Facebook and it sold out instantly with oh, wow. friends of friends like just people like yeah you know, hearing about it and do it. So I had. 12 people or something which we figured we'd do and i had i brought in my hunting mentors like my, my hunting mentor jeff who's i don't know 70 something now and i think i don't know who was the other you know it was larry or anyways i brought in my my hunting mentor <laughs> i thought you just made up those names earlier these are actual dudes 
<laughs> yeah, dudes. Yeah, <laughs> Jeff nice. and Larry. Yeah, they're guys I've been hunting with for thirty five years. So, cool. uh, they, anyway, so so they so they come. They they're gonna come and help me with this. So they're gonna share this knowledge and mentorship, which is the big gap, right? So I kind of just like sit these guys around the fire, wind them up. They sell stories. I I deliver this programming in and around it, some structured learning. Um. Anyway, so before the first workshop, so I've got all these like concepts of of learning modules sort of scripted out and a bit of a an agenda that I'm going to run these 12 people through. And I'm, of course, I'm super nervous as I'm leading into this. So it's yeah. the night before everybody's arrived at the night before they sat around the fire, had a dinner. We're all going to get together at eight o'clock in the morning, coffee, and then we're going to kick off this curriculum. And yeah. of course I can't sleep. So I wake up at like five and I'm waiting, tossing and turning and stress. Yeah, and wired. So, yeah. So, so I'm like, well, whatever, I'll grab my gun and I go for a walk on the property. So I go for a walk on the property and I go a little loop there's a couple spots I've been watching that are pretty deary. And I kind of, I loop back across this sort of deary spot. And sure enough, there's a spike buck standing like oh, wow. in the perfect spot. Yeah. So I shoot it. It hits the deck. I'm like, oh, thank God. Great. Yeah. And, I, and I, look at my, I look at my watch. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be the guy who's running a hunting course and then doesn't shoot the deer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there's that. I'm, I'm good at missing too. Um, so I look at my watch. It's it's 8.01. I'm like, oh, shit, I got to get back. So I run back down to the, lo the, the, the lodge and, and I burst in the front door. Now it's like seven or eight minutes later. And and there's like there's these 12 people all staring at me going, God, the guy's late for his first lesson. And yeah. what the hell are we doing here? And we took a flyer on this guy and he's just like, he yeah. had, you know, he hasn't made an appearance yet. And I'm like, hey, everybody, welcome to the UL workshop. Grab your coffees and yeah. your knife. We're going up the hill. We got a deer to deal with. <laughs> wow. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. That's a that's a bang up start for sure. Yeah. Totally. So that was great because it actually set the agenda from there on out. We had this deer to process and everything mm. else fell into place. So, and then we kind of built a rep, you know, a program that was replicable from there that we could do without necessarily shooting a deer at 8 a.m. Yeah. on the beginning yeah. of the workshop. <laughs> on the but, opening day, that kind of sets a high precedent if that's what you have to do every time. <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. But yeah, nonetheless, it was a, it was a really good, good format. So, so we're still doing that. And here we are 12 years later, you're going to come up and hang out and we're going to do a, yeah. uh, um, our workshop, we've got it just gotten better. We just have, you know, we've partnered with my friend Jody Peck, who's an amazing wild chef, and she's going to come and cook for us. We've moved, unfortunately, the, our original ranch, Singing Lands Ranch, burnt down. So, um, oh. in one of the fires, so we're, it's no longer the same facility. So, we've Jeez. temporarily moved to our friend's, another friend's ranch, who happened to be one of the workshoppers at that first workshop I just described oh, as cool. their first connection to honey. They were your oh, or, original, cool. like, yeah, yeah OG. <laughs> Eat while there's like a couple yeah. of nonprofit workers downtown east side, uh, oh. work working in the nonprofit sector down on east side, came out to that workshop as a as a way to connect to their food, became hunters, Neat. bought a ranch, and now we're are hosting the future. Wow. Or, that gives me goosebumps. That's like a, a an OG original supporters coming full circle to be able to support other people doing that same thing. It sounds like they obviously took a lot from that if they shifted their entire lifestyle from city to farm well i think i think people already want to do it right they're just looking for a way to do it and if you can kind yeah. of lift people up a little bit and give them a foundation to then explore the next step then yeah that's the big that's the big part of what we're trying to do is just just remove some barriers and make people feel comfortable and give us some community around it too right yeah so. yeah and so okay so that's um that's one workshop that you guys run so what does eat wild offer to the community now because you guys have evolved into several yeah. more fields or avenues yeah for, for sure like we're a bit limited in terms of what we can do because of you know as, as i mentioned i'm still working i still have my priority is my full-time career with parks yeah. and so we just kind of come up with you know cool projects that we like doing on the side but there's been lots of them we look back like we just um we just posted our eat wild by the sea um yeah, uh workshop <laughs> and yeah it's gonna be pretty fun this spring and we've got a one of the most beautiful places in the world to go hang out at. We're going to mm. go uh, show people how to uh, pick oysters and clams and pull cron traps and then take them back to, cool. uh, it's actually my, my sister-in-law's homestead in, um, in Jervis Inlet. And nice. we're going to have a long table dinner in this beautiful, uh, beautiful remote place and then take people back to the mainland and they can, yeah. Yeah. But just a really amazing experience. We'll bring in, uh, yeah, professional chefs to do the cooking and, um, We'll we'll show people how we everything you'd want to know about how to harvest shellfish and how to process mm. it and how to store it and then ultimately how to eat it. 
Yeah. <laughs> very needed. So yeah. Very important fun. part. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. That's fun. But yeah, that's kind of one, one end of the spectrum for sure. Like some of these like foodie events, we've done some cooking workshops in Vancouver. We do a monthly butchering workshop in Vancouver, which has been a lot of fun. We just teach people yeah. how to, you know, that moment when you walk up to an animal and, and you're, well, you will experience this when you walk up to an animal, you're like, Oh Fingers my goodness, yeah. what have I done? I, I don't yeah. want, I want to make sure I treat this animal with complete yeah. and total respect. And yeah and uh want to make and not sure waste that, anything not yeah. waste a thing and and so we're going to show you how to do that and how to remove that barrier and feel good about the process and feel confident cool. going into that yeah um, we and then i guess what else we were doing um spent a lot of time since covid building online learning content um which I yeah i was think- gonna say if people can't access say a physical bow hunting or field hunting or ocean um uh, harvesting yeah. workshop they can also access to you guys through online resources yeah so we did a pile of like youtube courses in early days of youtube and i um early days of youtube early days of eat well but it was also kind of early days of how-to stuff on youtube and mm-hmm. built a bunch of stuff there that kind of gave us a bit of a lift um and we're still doing a little bit of that for sure where we can find time uh but really where i'm focusing is kind of these long long format conversations with learners through the online courses so it's kind of mm-hmm. a you know if you want to learn about a subject and I, I i don't mind talking about stuff as you can tell um yeah and but yeah built into a long conversation uh with slides and video and just my process mm-hmm. for cool. you know how to hunt elk or how to hunt deer or how to yeah. still hunt um, meat care in the field is another one e-scouting is a big one that um, yeah. people are super interested in yeah. and just you know, if you want to know how to do it, you can spend 20 bucks and, you know, I'll talk at you for six hours or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and you also, speaking of talking at, you also have the Eat Wild podcast where you do those long form interviews with people on these different topics. So people can hear not only from you, but from other people in the field as well who might have different tactics or techniques and stuff that they're doing. Yeah. And that's what we've done with that online learning program, because I, I do enjoy those conversations so much. And, and I know that you're learning, you're probably realizing that hey this is a great way to have conversations with people oh yeah yeah so i've taken that and and kind of invited those some of those experts back and and we just do a slideshow together and we have a Mm -hmm. have a conversation record it over a slideshow talk and then build that sort of structured learning in the conversation and record it and then and then edit it and then share that back out as an online course so it's sort of a mock online course mock podcast episode yeah and um but yeah, you're getting the best of like, you know, some of the, what I think are the best hunters in BC yeah. talking about, you know, their, their approaches to hunting. So I figure it's got some value in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so with Eat Wild and maybe this has changed over time, but who's, who's the audience? Like, who are you seeing coming to the hunting community um, as a demographic, maybe age wise or gender wise, or like, where are you seeing that shift in, in community? Um, you know, I, I really wish we, we could have tracked that. I would love to, to have a, like an actual statistical answer for you. Mm. Um, generic. But, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, but like, uh, you know, anecdotally for sure. Like, I think, you know, I'm always a little bit shocked when I walk into a room and there's no women. I'm like, Oh, this sucks. Like what happened here? Mm. Like we, we missed yeah. the part, you know, so there's like, you know, typically we run at 20 or 30% female participation in our workshops. What yeah. I do find is that women are, are, more likely to invest in learning. So some of our higher price tag learning, um, we see a higher percentage of women participating, which is, means that women are smarter and they recognize the importance <laughs> of investing in learning resources. They're like, I can just skip a whole bunch of the like hard knock school of life learning and just go straight to the goods. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and men are just like, oh, I, want, I don't have to listen to Dylan. I'll just go do it. I'll figure and it I'll out. I'll do it myself. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, totally. But you might, I, yeah. Sure. So I just think like, you wouldn't go backcountry skiing without taking a, avalanche course and that's just like so much yeah. value in it just to learn how to be in the backcountry in the snow yeah. environment let alone being safer around avalanches like yeah it's such a it's so it, it's the hardest it's the hardest thing to do like hunting is by far the hardest thing to learn how to yeah. do yeah and one of yet, the most difficult things i've ever tried yeah like and it doesn't get any easier ever like it just gets hard, like you just <laughs> it's super hard so like you know why not invest in some learning yet there's no you know you get this the core class which is like hopelessly inadequate to yeah. support anybody to become a hunter and then yeah. there, you, there you are right so yeah it's kind of like every almost every piece of education i've ever received um in life you you get like this foundational almost historical knowledge 
but none of the practical knowledge that you actually need to execute on whatever sport, task, job, career thing that you're trying to do. There's such a disconnect between what you learn in a classroom and then what you actually need to know on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's there's a huge gap. And, and, and I mean, and there's also like, as I'm going down these avenues of like, Oh, I'm going to teach people how to still hunt. And, and I get these little ideas around what I think people need to know, but there's still like these huge areas of hunting that, I just don't do or not interested in or, or mm -hmm. haven't developed an experience like just think yeah. waterfowl hunting for example like there's so there's such amazing opportunities in the waterfowl hunting world yeah. yet i'm not really a waterfowl hunter right so yeah. you know if there's so much more and that's a whole learning thing and it's one that i've you know been, yeah I've, I've gone down that road a couple times i love it but it's yeah, yeah it's i'm definitely of, interested in it my friend lee he um he chairs up the BHA backcountry hunters and anglers in region two. And he's always posting stuff about waterfowl hunting and being out there. And um, part of it for me here in the Okanagan is that it, we're limited on um, lakes where you can find ducks or water bodies of water where you can find fowl that are going to be in huntable areas and not within a city limit type thing. Um, yeah. so I think location plays a big part in driving Actually. that interest for some people. Yeah, for sure. Hugely. And, and you take advantage of what's available to you and develop an expertise in those areas, which is mm -hmm. kind of what I, you know, I just, I learned how to, I learned how to white to hunt. So that's what I do. I do that really well. And I learned how to elk hunt and I do that well. And yeah, um, but there's, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a waterfowl hunter and yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, you mentioned that you were chasing quail in the Okanagan when you were a kid. So did you grow up in the Okanagan or where, where are you originally from? Uh, I'm really originally from Vancouver. Um, we had yeah, okay. family That's friends right. in around uh, Oliver, and um, mm. we would go and visit them, you know, at least for a week or two in the summer, if not a couple times. And uh, so, always maintained a connection there. And I, I still hunt, you know, in the anywhere. I, well, the Okanagan. Mm -hmm. Well, my wife and I go to the Okanagan pretty regularly just to go enjoy the wineries, and we'll bring yeah. our guns <laughs> as well. So, bring your guns with you, not to the wineries, not, not to the wineries, wineries, but there's always like <laughs> oh, this the yeah, just, yeah. just you know, on the way to and from the Okanagan, mm -hmm. we'll. Um, yeah, stop in a winery and yeah. Yeah, there's some great hunting between the Okanagan and the lower mainland. So yeah, I was just, I re remembered you saying that and then I thought, was there a period of time where you were here? But because chasing quail is, uh, I mean, those are itty bitty little guys. It's not a lot of, not a lot of meat on those. <laughs> easy to miss. Yeah. yeah, easy to miss for sure. Um, And so... <laughs> Is there a target audience that Eat Wild is trying to reach other than obviously the, the generic non-hunting population that wants to learn? But do you guys have a focus audience that you're trying to reach out to that if somebody's listening to this podcast and they think, oh, that's me, I am your target audience and they can reach out further? You know, we haven't done any strategic marketing in that sense. We, we, we actually just did a bit of marketing work with, uh, with, a, with a guy um, going to help us better understand this world mm -hmm. a little bit about how do you reach different yeah. people. But, you know, by and large, like when I walk into a classroom, like there is, there's gender equity, there's, uh, you know, there's ethnic e equity. I, maybe that's the wrong word. I should probably brush up, but there's the different, there's cultural diversity oh, in good. every classroom yeah. and which is really cool. And, and, and it just feels like it's kind of happening. And it's like, yeah, um, you know, it's something that I, you know, we work on in my parks world as well, like as a park manager and, 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 you know, again, we saw a de decrease in park usage as the baby mm -hmm. boomers were aging out of, say, being in the backcountry and doing those types of things. Um, and we were all sitting around our parks, you know, meetings going, gosh, we're like losing usage. People are not coming out. How do we mm -hmm. connect with new Canadians and families that don't have a connection to camping or hiking? How do we mm -hmm. make parks relevant to people? Yeah. Well, well, you know, without even doing anything like Totally, because we're government, we can't do anything very well. We just we do, we do something. <laughs> we can sort talk of about it though. Yeah. Well, we, we we say, hey, this is a problem. Like, how do we solve yeah. the problem? But we don't have the resources or the 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 ability to really necessarily. We're we're slow to the game. Like we can't. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're not pro it's molasses. Yeah, we're government. It's it's we have processes yeah. and we're not proactive necessarily. And but what's crazy is that in that time of like being molasses and slowly moving towards how do we do this, it just happened, and mm. all of a sudden our parks are super well utilized by a by i would say a fairly a, a huge cross section of canadians and new canadians mm -hmm. and the, the, the cultural diversity you would see when going into a golden ears or a cultus lake or a cypress provincial park is is incredible and so yeah especially the last few years 
Yeah, totally. It's awesome. And and I mean, I think it just it's all you know what it, it it's social media and it's just about the the big the biggest thing is just that people need to see themselves in these places. And if they're yeah. not represented in these yeah. places through photographs, through videos, through mm -hmm. storytelling, then they then just the, then they don't feel there's a place for you. And yeah. and all it takes is somebody going up to you know out to Joffrey Lake and stand on a log and take a picture of themselves. They're like, Hey, I, I look like that person. I recognize that person. Hey, that person did it. I can do it. That could be me. Yeah. That could be me. I have to say I do my bone to pick with that though, is that some of the really nice, like secret places get blown up on social media and then they're no longer secrets. And then everybody and their dogs out there and you're like, damn it. Okay. Now I have to find a new secret place, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's always good to keep exploring, but sometimes you got to go pretty darn far into the backwoods to get away from where the, uh, the photo takers are going to be. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You have you have the privilege and the ability to yeah. do that, and yeah, a lot of totally. folks don't. And the far yeah. they, like, you know, the, as far as they can get is, you know, the House on Crest Trail in Vancouver or the Joffrey Lakes Park. Yeah. You know, it's a fully supported experience, and that's yeah. as far as they're going to get. And it's great that they're doing it because you know what? They're connected yeah. to parks now. They're connected to nature, totally. and yeah. you know what? You and I and others like I got to get in a float plane to have the experience that I want to have. What I oh, I'm, not, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> I can still drive to where I, where I want to be. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it is. We are very fortunate to live, uh, especially me in the Okanagan. I can drive 15 minutes and I'm out in the middle of the mm. woods. Um, you know, people living in larger cities or who don't have a vehicle, that's a, a bit more of a challenge either by access or by distance to be able to even get to those places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I think we're very fortunate. So I think it's just about flipping it and appreciating it. I mean, I know that there's mm -hmm. a lot of folks who are like, I catch the odd bit of shit for like recruiting new hunters into the space. And people are like, yeah. you know, there's enough hunters or whatever. I'm like, yeah, you know what? It's We're a lot better off to have more diversity and more people hunting, mm -hmm. more voices advocating for yeah. this way of life. Yeah. yeah, all that. And like, it's just because if it's just a bunch of bunch of old aging white dudes it's just not like nobody not cares gonna about last very long. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 it's been really neat to see i mean as a new hunter and a new female hunter into the the scene in the last three years um it's been really nice to actually see quite a bit of diversity uh in ethnicity and gender in even my sphere here in the okanagan i i ran into other female hunters in the woods last year or this past season. Um, I mean, obviously we're in the same areas if we're running into each other. So that was not great being uh, in, in the same zone and being like, oh shit, somebody's already here. Um, but it was nice to run into people and go, oh, hey, wow, another female hunter out here in the woods by themselves. Um, so that's, it's good to see that that's actually happening. That there is also a youngification happening of the the population of hunters and the interest level is, is getting younger and younger. Yep with youngification for sure yeah. it's great to see and yeah and i love that's what i love about the bha is that they're creating a place for a community to build uh mm -hmm. and with with some of those tenants in mind like diversity and inclusion being yeah. at the forefront and you know and you know not you know being welcoming to the conversations with indigenous communities about where we go next mm -hmm. and, and some of these complex things that we're going to have to deal with as a community and you know we just have to get to a place where we're, you know, we're able to have those conversations and that level of acceptance and understanding. Yeah. And, and collaboration. I, like I grew up in a First Nations community and part of one of my, um, I guess, goals through chairing Region 8 for backcountry hunters and anglers here is to create that bigger and deeper bond um, between First Nations and the non-Indigenous hunting population. Because we do, there is so much, I mean, that's a whole different topic, but there's so much historical and political background to those conversations um, that uh, myself as a newcomer to the hunting scene, I'm like, let's just, why can't we just move forward together? You know, like maybe there's a little bit of naivety there, but sometimes you need that, that freshness and not the jadedness to be able to bridge those gaps. I think, um, or I'm hoping anyways, that's my goal is to be able to, to create more conversations and more community that involves everybody in where this did, region anyways. Where'd you grow up? I grew up here in the Okanagan. Yeah. Okay. So I grew up um, participating in a lot of the Kelowna Friendship Society's activities and going to ceremonies every week and and hanging out on the res. And um, yeah, there was that was a lot of my childhood and my my upbringing and my youth was in, engrossed and totally um, indoctrinated into First Nations culture and ceremonies. Cool. Well, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was very fortunate to have that experience and to really grow up with a groundedness and in nature and a respect for nature, which has played a lot into mm-hmm. why I wanted to get into hunting as an adult and an late onset adult hunter um, and having a different perspective of where my food comes from and, and just that respect for the animals that we are eating and harvesting and using the whole animal because that's that's a huge part of First Nations culture is that you don't you don't waste anything. Anything that can be used is used from the hide to to antlers to organ meat to the actual um, regular meat that people prefer to have usually. Um, but yeah, no, no part of an animal goes wasted if it can be used. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so within Eat Wild, I guess one of the things that uh, you mentioned earlier, and I wonder if if there's a focus or if there's something you guys are doing with this, is that gap for mentorship. So for example, myself as a new hunter, I found it really challenging in the first couple of years to find mentorship. I was pretty fortunate to run into people in the woods who then offered to mentor me. So that was lucky on my part. Um, but is that something that Eat Wild is offering or or striving to offer in that gap outside of maybe the selective courses? But is there some sort of network that you know of where new hunters can get a mentor versus just say an education? Yeah. So on two fronts, I mean, I think the one big win of the hunter field skills workshop or the backpack, we do a, a backpack hunter workshop, teach people how oh. to go take, get to their backpacks and go hunting in the Alpine nice. um, or more recently the, our bow hunting workshop. Like mm-hmm. if you go to any of these, you're going to be surrounded by 10 or 12 other learners that are at the same place in their journey that value learning, that value the opportunity to connect with other folks. Mm-hmm. And so that's like a great place to start because you get to make a friend over two or yeah. three days you're hanging out. And and some of those relationships are really carry on. And the community, usually every time we do one of these, we have a little a Facebook group that comes or a, mm-hmm. a WhatsApp group that stays connected. And they, you know, it, it's a way to find those folks to learn how to hunt with. Yeah. Um, but, you know, facilitating that outside of a workshop, you know, we, we do a couple of fundraisers every year. We bring folks together. We do a fundraiser for the BHA here in the lower mainland. We, we mm-hmm. do a, I do a, a talk on how, how to get the most out of the LEH program, the limited entry hunting program. Mm, nice. Last year, I think we raised three or five grand for conservation with the BC, the B, BC, um, uh, local chapter of the BC BHA. Nice. Um, and then, you know, really like, you know, the way that I see it, where, where I suggest to people and what I think the best route forward is to partner with the BHA um, mm-hmm. and continue to work with them to, you know, you know, support these folks who are looking for a place to land. Mm-hmm. And and I think we, you know, early days of BHA in, in the lower mainland, I was pretty involved with the, with the early group of folks, Jenny Lee, Chris Prin, yeah, and uh, folks like, yeah, they're good, good people. And, and, you know, we were all kind of at, involved uh mark robichaud early on and kind of was like oh this is great like this is like i think mark brought it to to the lord mainland and and you know i we were able to kind of jump in and kind of set a you know a bit of a terms of reference for our group and kind of set the wow. context and and there was some, some great folks that came out early on and kind of established that culture and and um and and now lee is involved in taking over that mm-hmm. that group and i think it's just that to me that's the coolest place and and i think that yeah. trying to connect people back to bha we, we have a you know the well podcast is sponsored mm-hmm. by the bha and you know that's the consistent message it's like hey if you want to want to meet people go out to a bha event yeah and like get you know go out and have a beer with some folks get involved in a conservation project mm-hmm. that's how you're going to meet folks and i think that's yeah. the like I, I love that ability because there, there really is no like it's not you know i can't say that the BC Wildlife Federation is the place to send young, ambitious young hunters. I, I just don't feel like they're they're at a place where they 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 just don't have that that open door to something like that. Whereas, yeah, if like, you're really hardcore into conservation and policy and that type of stuff, BCWF is for sure the place to go. If you're looking more for community and mentorship and those connections on a local level, definitely BHA is that's something that we strive for is to have that that community feel and aspect. And um, one of the amazing things that I've discovered in chairing for our region here in region eight is that, yeah, there are a ton of um, seasoned hunters. I won't say older because some of them aren't really that old. They've just been hunting since they were kids, Uh, but seasoned hunters who are more than willing to share their stories if given a platform and a space to do so, and to be able to mentor new, new people who are getting into uh, the field. So yeah, that that's a great, great point to bring back to is BHA is for sure a spot to, to connect from, 
new person to a more experienced person for sure. Yeah, for sure. No, it's been it's been fun, and I and I really I commend the efforts. Like, you know, code was tough on BHA and a lot of volunteer groups, and trying yeah. to build back from that. You know, that tough place. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to reconnecting with the crew that have bringing it back here in the at least in, in our region, region two. And it yeah, sounds like, sounds like you guys are doing well in region eight, and hopefully, I'll get out to an event when I'm passing through. Yeah, um, yeah, that would be awesome. We'll we'll aim we'll aim to make something happen there because I think the information that you have at Eat Wild and the courses and the education, that part uh, we don't focus so much on with BHA. We're more about that community and some conservation and policy work uh, and supporting BCWF on their their bigger voice and that sort of thing. But the education component and aspect I think would be amazing. And that's why there's such a good synergy between Eat Wild and BHA and and having those cross sponsorships and stuff is it's they're both focusing on the same things of community filling that gap between people who know nothing and people who know a lot of things and and getting that transfer of knowledge from like you said a bunch of people are probably going to maybe pass on or wander away from the hunting sphere and being able to make sure that information isn't lost um, and gets transferred to the next generation of hunters yeah for sure no yeah. i think it's important and it's fun. It's fun too. Cause it's it, yeah. like, it's something I talk about a little bit too. Like in the, there's hunting is a really cool place because it, it allows for cross generational relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's not, there's not a lot of places that you can really form a friendship with someone who is 20, 30 or 40 years old with older than you. Or and 70, yeah. 70, <laughs> yeah. And, and have a genuine connection and both bring so much to the relationship. Yeah. And, you know, obviously elders and mentors provide knowledge and then the younger folks provide spirit and hard work and keenness that keeps folks going. But mm -hmm. we had, um, we celebrated Larry's 70th, 80th, wow. 70th white tail hunt this year. 70th white tail hunt. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So he shot, That's he, he mm -hmm. shot a white tail deer or, or I think, yeah, he shot a white tail deer every year for the past seven years. And That's amazing. Uh, maybe maybe it's a deer. I don't know if it's white tail deer or deer, but he's that he's he's harvested a deer every year for the past yeah. years. And and he's and it was first white tail camp was when he was twelve or something like that. And he I think it might even wow. anyways, maybe it's a 70 fifth. Regardless, anyways, we we had a bit of a party on a white white tail <laughs> camp this year and we invited and so where we hunt, you know, it's it's not a secret spot by any means, but I'll keep it as secret as I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's a number of other hunters that, you know, friends of mine and other folks that are relations that are uh, or hunting in and around within an hour's drive cool. of the valley. So I invited everybody to dinner. Cool. And we had, I think we had about 30 people in camp, and we wow. served dinner for 30 people. And then we sat around the campfire and we talked about, um, yeah, we just, we, you know, shared stories about how much every one of us had been impacted by Larry's mentorship mm -hmm. and That's knowledge cool. and community. And basically just had an opportunity to say thank you to him for, you know, being a, he actually won the gosh the there was a the the, the Barnsby Award I believe it is it's a conservation mm -hmm. award from the BC cool. Wildlife Federation he got that a couple of years ago and was um, from his you know lifetime of conservation work and uh, wow yeah and just but more so he's just like anytime he meets somebody that's keen to hunt he's got time for them and shares his knowledge and yeah you know, that's, he inspires that's people amazing. and and uh, so yeah it was really it was a beautiful moment so really cool to see it yeah so yeah that's yeah. That's really cool. And it's really amazing that you guys took the time to honor him for that, because I think a lot of people in this community um, so far I've met mostly knock on wood, really amazing people that are willing to share their knowledge. Of course, there's always going to be people who want to kind of keep things close to their chest and, and hold that exclusive club. But the people that are willing to share are amazing and they should be honored for that because I think they do a, a lot of it. They just do thanklessly. They see somebody that's new. They want to help. They offer information. And often they never get even a thank you for that. Um, but yeah, that's that's amazing. You guys took the time to celebrate him with a 30-person a wild dinner. Yeah, sitting around the campfire. It was pretty special for sure. Yeah. Um, and so for Eat Wild for 2024, what is the vision moving forward into the future? It's a good question. Um, we just did a big lift on our on our sort of uh, our website platform which is just kind of getting things a little more automated a little easier for us to 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 connect with people and and mm -hmm. get people into our courses and stay connected so hopefully it'll sort of allow us to step back and focus on some project stuff um you know i'm a big uh you know the one thing i actually want to do which i i i, I want to do a podcast specifically on 
the, the seasons of eating wild with my friend Jody and hopefully my mm. my friend Spencer. So Spencer's Shimshin as an indigenous perspective, obviously from yeah. his seasons of eating wild through the lens of an indigenous person. Uh, Jody is from the north and she's a wild chef, and then of course myself. And it'd be fun to just you know set out a project of doing a, a you know a cuff eight part episode or something like that on. Yeah eating wild food and that'd be kind of fun though that, that's that'd you know, be amazing like, be fun but it's also like yeah just the time is always i'm, I'm always aware like over committing yeah. time um yeah but, you know, but it can happen over time right it doesn't have to be fast cool projects like that are often better when they're they're spaced out and there's time for to absorb and to create the vision that you have so that would be amazing yeah and i think i do it a bit different like like we just do you know kind of build the the eight parts or something like that but not necessarily like do them all sort of over the course of a of a time period and not necessarily mm -hmm. have to like get it together to get together every month and bang something out just kind of figure maybe do that to do a different format i've learned a lot about yeah. this podcasting and i think it would yeah. do it differently if i did it all over again <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure um and you've mentioned we a few times so eat wild is is not just you who is the we behind it well, first and foremost is my wife Mickey, who's you know always dealing with the the a lot of the coordination and yeah. programming and getting getting things together to to make it actually all work out. And so she's she's she might be the person that mm -hmm. connects with you via email, and she'll also mm -hmm. be the person who's you know putting everything together and get loading the truck with me and showing up at events and welcoming mm -hmm. people. And then and then uh, and always you know and she's also a hunter and also you know someone that really loves being part of these events and cooking and and does a tremendous amount of work to support yeah. eat wild and um yeah so you guys are a powerhouse team for sure yes and then of course we have an awesome team so we have um rob wilson who's uh who leads a lot of our firearms and, and a lot of field men men mentoring stuff whether it's our backpack hunter workshop or field workshop and of course jody peck is another huge part of our team and she's our wild chef and selena is our naturalist and you know, biologist and enthusiast about all things you know butchering and such of, of mm. animals so we got it we have an awesome team and of course yeah. martine martine has come back she she was off for a couple couple of years and she's back now leading courses and uh oh. in kamloops and and uh it's doing awesome so yeah um yeah we've got a great team and um great to have some yeah, good good folks that are everybody works like full-time professional jobs and just yeah and then has this, this passion yeah yeah and it gives us all a place to get together and we have these like big events that are super hard to pull together and then everybody leaves and we're like oh my god that was so hard <laughs> but that was fun right we'll do it again yeah, we'll do it again yeah give <laughs> yeah. it like it's it's like they say with children right like after you have a kid there they're like oh never again because it was so much work and so painful and then you give it like two three four five months and you're like ah oh, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, 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 let's do that let's, again. Let's do another cooking workshop. That was so yeah. fun. Yeah. 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 You forget about all the painful parts because the good yeah. parts are so amazing. Well, it, it is amazing. I mean, what else are you going to do with your time? I mean, you got to do something yeah. and, and connecting with people and sharing this way of life with people. It's yeah. pretty darn fun. And yeah, and giving back and service to others is uh, very, very fulfilling. Yeah. And it has an impact on people. Like there's, 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 yeah. there's cool notes you get once in a while that, you know, just, just yeah, you just feel very lucky. Well, Look at this, the story of the people who came to your very, very first ever one and eventually changed their whole lifestyle. And now you're hosting uh, your field workshop at their ranch. Like that's that's a pretty cool impact to be able to have on somebody's life. Even if, you know, you weren't maybe the reason, but you were a catalyst, you were a trigger. There was something in there that sparked for them that went, okay, yeah, this is this is big enough that we're going to change our lifestyle. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. What, one of my favorite stories of connection that is... Uh, so Larry, who I've told you about, 86 mm -hmm. or 87 years old this year. He, so I've had him on a couple of my, over COVID, I would invite him out to come join me on these Eat Wild webinar series mm -hmm. where we're just talking about hunting. And I get Larry on to talk about mule deer hunting or sharing his knowledge in one capacity or another. And I'd interview him and we'd have this audience of folks, right? Mm -hmm. So we have like 60 people in our Zoom audience and I'm, talk and I'm talking about mule deer hunting with Larry and getting pulling stories out of him and having tons of fun and it's a great great way to connect and over those long COVID nights it was a very popular activity while we were doing mm -hmm. it and at the end of the the uh the the workshop there's one guy named Dylan who was hanging around like virtually hanging around and he's like hey I just wanted to ask Larry something and, and he's like he says Larry are you from Langley and uh and he said yeah I'm from Langley he said did you, did you ever hunt with a guy named Al and he's like 
Oh, Al. Yeah, Al. He's oh, he's an old, he's a great guy. Oh, I love Al. Yeah, he's so he's passed on now, but he was such a good hunter. Oh, I love that guy. He's like, he's like, well, Al's my Al's my grandfather. And oh wow. And I've just come to want to learn how to hunt. And my dad never hunted, but he said that all my dad could tell me when I was trying to get into hunting is, oh, it's too bad Al's gone. But if Al was there, Al's old friend Larry, if you could find oh, Larry from Langley, <laughs> he's a really good guy and he knows a lot about hunting. If you can find him, you should, you, 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 you'd be, you know, that's a good place to start. Yeah. And then here he is on a Zoom call on of, a all Zoom place, call. Yeah. of all places. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Larry. It's just, yeah, it's amazing the synchronicities and it's not a, like, it's a small community once you're in it. Everybody knows everybody who knows somebody who's one degree away from this person or that person. So yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty neat for that to come all the way around for him to be like, are you Larry from Langley? Yeah. yeah. So that was a highlight. So that fireside chat of the 30 people around the fire celebrating Larry, Dylan was there and Dylan got oh, to cool. tell that story in front of everybody. And it was nice. like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring some pretty, tears out. Pretty magical, yeah. Pretty magical. Because yeah. I mean, those are that's pretty cool. And and it's yeah. you know, and Larry and Larry and Dylan are hunting partners now. And oh, cool. And, and like it's great for both of them. And and yeah. such a great connection for Dylan to have to, you know, a grandfather he never got to hunt with. And and it's, it recharges Larry's batteries to have someone who's fired up and keeps Larry yeah. young. And and uh, yeah, so pretty cool. Yeah, thing. that's cool. I'm uh, I've become a, a very large fan of. Um, hunting camps and deer camps and bonfire gatherings like that, because there's just, there's so many cool stories and so much knowledge that gets passed around. So, you know, even, even in my, my season so far where I haven't harvested any large animals, at least you get to get to hear stories from other people who've done it. So it makes it, makes it, makes it worthwhile in the, uh, the interim. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah. it's definitely a special part of the hunting program for sure. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. I've got some last minute uh, rapid fire questions that I, I need to ask you. Um, of course. So uh, uh, first, before that, a standing wrap up question that I always ask is what would be your, uh, you know, one minute or less recommendation to new hunters? That one thing that you wish somebody had told you when you were first starting out? Uh, it's, I think invest in the iHunter app. And, I, mm. and um, full disclosure, they they support me a little bit on the podcast to talk yeah. about their stuff. But but I genuinely the reason why is because I feel so strongly about having um, that platform. It, it just knowing where private land boundaries are, knowing mm -hmm. how to, having that tool in your pocket that can help navigate, having a tool that that you can document your hunts and the places that you found that are like notable spots where deer were hanging around or maybe where you yeah. killed a deer or where a deer trail is and you mark that all in your in your iAnter app and it catalogs all that for you and holds on to that information um but it's just in a really power tool powerful tool to 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 stay to plan to scout to, and then to track your hunts and ultimately get back to the truck you know, without getting lost. Um, that's like, <laughs> it's such a powerful yeah. tool. So like over the years, I, I've been, I built a whole different set of skills to navigate the woods, which is super important with, you know, maps and compasses, but really like it all comes together with that app and it really mm -hmm. keeps you in a good, get, gets you in a good start. So yeah. I'd start there, but it's, you know, when I say invest in the app, I don't just mean invest the 10 bucks a year. I mean, invest in learning how to use the app yeah. and applying it and developing expertise and skill and learning it. I'd also yeah. make sure you know how to use a compass because I would never suggest. I say what I should say is put a compass in your pocket on a little <laughs> string. Yeah, know how that works, and yeah. then invest in the iHunter app. And then, yeah. and that's the that's a good place to start. Yeah, I need a I need a compass workshop here in the Okanagan because I have a compass, but gosh darn, if I were lost in the forest, I don't know that I could use it to get out. So, that's well, you know what, you'll I... get you'll get the 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 you'll get it at the hunter workshop. But you'll be nice. you can jump in for the how to use a compass piece for perfect sure. good good okay and so rapid fire questions you get like one or two words per answer so uh what was the first animal you ever harvested uh white-tailed deer white-tailed deer okay uh what's your favorite hunting resource whether that's a podcast book a forum maybe an app you can't say i hunter again so let's pick a different one <laughs> Oh yeah, it's easy. Uh, the the Val Geist collection of of uh, of books on the different species in, of of ungulates. Okay, cool. So Doctor Val Geist, he's a a biologist that was a really good writer. Nice, awesome. He passed away last I'm gonna year. check that out. 
Yeah. Uh, what is one thing you should never do as a hunter in the woods? Oh, God, there's so many things you should never do. <laughs> okay, you can give your top two. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Okay, well, I think the first thing is just like really respecting uh, people's knowledge. So if someone like... You should respect people's knowledge. Yeah, you should respect yeah, people's okay. knowledge. So don't go, don't go. If someone takes you hunting somewhere and says, hey, "This is my secret spot. I'm going to show you how to hunt." Don't go back there without permission. Like, don't mm. hunt someone's secret spot without permission. I think that's yeah. kind of a shitty thing to do. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the other thing is just you know having when you commit to taking the shot, knowing you have the confidence and the skills to make the shot. Yeah. And. And I'm not saying that I, like I, I I make bad decisions still about my shooting, and I'm not suggesting it's something that is 100. percent But I think that Never, yeah. being confident with your shooting and knowing what you're capable of and what the bullet's capable of doing is and the rifle is extremely important and yeah. being responsible. Don't take a bad that. shot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is your favorite hunting snack? Oh, that's easy. Um, uh, J N and Z sausage. So commercial drive first and commercial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Very Zoki, specific. <laughs> Z Zoki and Natasha make the, the absolutely best um, uh, sausage. It's a Eastern European sausage, and uh, it's super dry. So what's what's amazing mm -hmm. about it is you can throw it in your backpack, and it can just like kick around your backpack, and you don't have to like those nuts stay refrigerated. So I probably mm -hmm. still have a couple of like half pieces of sausage in my hunting bag which i haven't hunted for two or three weeks now and i can if i get if i want if i feel snacky i can go up there and grab it and <laughs> go find them <laughs> it's my emergency food i leave it in my hunting pack just in yeah, case it's it's of winter yeah. i run out of yeah. food yeah <laughs> jan yeah, J and Z on commercial drive it's the best sausage in the world nice um do you wear a double layer of socks or one layer of socks when you hunt uh, I wear, there's something called the right socks, which are actually a double layered sock all built into one. So they oh, avoid, they, okay. Yeah, I, I got into them over, I'm a backcountry skier. So mm. uh, back in the day, just, yeah, really reduces um, uh, blistering. Mm, yeah, Lots critical. Yeah, I learned that. Not in hunting, thankfully, the very first time I ever did a multi-day backpacking hike, I wore proper socks for the first five days. And then on the last day, I'm like, oh, nice pair of clean cotton socks. Put those on for the hike out. Yeah, I had blisters um, like nobody's business on on the last day when we got back to the car. So thankfully, I didn't do that on day one, but I learned the value of a good pair of socks. Um, do you have a lucky item that you take hunting with you? Hmm. You know, I've got uh, one of, um, I, I had a, uh, an indigenous youth from, um, I want to say his territory, but I'm just, just it, it's slipping my mind, Mi'kmaq, I think. Um, and I, I, I might be wrong, but young, young guy lost connection to his indigenous heritage and he came to an Eat Wild workshop and um, he wanted to hunt. And uh, he was... Uh, came in, we had a great, great three-day workshop and really connected over the workshop. And he went on to, he actually made a couple connections at the workshop, went on for hunting, but, and then he kept on his journey to reconnect with his heritage. And uh, he grown some tobacco uh, as part of that process. And he, and he came back to me, gave me a little satchel of, of tobacco um, and, uh, and knocked on my door and he's a fan. And it's like, here, I wanted to give this to you. Um, oh, wow. And so I bring that around with me and I, and I take a little bit out and after I kill an animal and provide as an offering. Yeah. Um, but it was really, yeah, really cool. The, yeah, it was powerful for sure. So that's kind of packed, yeah. packed that around and it's been been lucky ever since. So that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, what is the one absolute essential item that you have to have on every hunt? If it, you couldn't forget it, it's the most critical piece. What is that one thing? My, my binoculars. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Like the yeah. first thing, I, I wouldn't. I, I'd rather go hunting without a gun than without my binoculars. It's about as yeah. useful. Like, yeah. 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 Basically. Yeah. Amazing. So, if people want to reach you, we will drop uh, links to the Ewald website and some contact information down below when this podcast is released. Um, and thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, I've got you're gonna have to come on the Wild Podcast because I've got a bunch of questions for you. I'd like to know, yeah, a whole yeah. bunch of things. So, so I'm really curious about your journey. So we'll make that happen. But we're gonna get to know each other here in the uh, in the spring at the Hunter Workshop and the Bow Hunting mm -hmm. Workshop, and uh, 
it'll be a fun hang. I think you're going to really enjoy the community and the, and the program. So that'll be a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, I'm very so. excited. And if people want to check out other workshops that are coming up in 2024, uh, it'll be in the link down below with Perfect. the website and all of that information there. So thank you so very much, Dylan, and we will talk to you soon. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in today to watch or listen and make sure to hit that like or subscribe button to follow along wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions, comments or reviews, please drop them down below. I will read them and I will get back to you. Or you can reach me at questions at entrypointhunting.com. If you know an expert or someone who offers great advice or is just growing rapidly in the field of hunting, angling or conservation, please send them my way. I would love to reach out and connect with them. And until next time, friends, stay hungry.